Well, thank you, um, Al and the MPCA for inviting me to share with you uh, the research that the USGS, U.S. Geological Survey, has done on this issue. Uh, the USGS is our nation's premier earth science agency, and it's non-regulatory. We do not advocate for any political position or regulatory action. I'm just here to present to you what the USGS has learned about the science of contamination associated with seal coats. All the technical points that I'm going to be presenting in this presentation um, have appeared in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and I think Al's going to post the presentation uh, at the very end is a list of all those references, and they're also available on our USGS website. So today, of, today, of course, we're talking about, about seal coat, which is the black, shiny liquid that is sprayed or painted on the asphalt pavement of parking lots, of driveways, and even of some playgrounds and pathways. I think it's worth mentioning here that it's very rarely used on roadways. Um, but seal coat is marketed as protecting the longevity and increasing the longevity of the underlying asphalt and approving the appearance of the pavement. Seal coat can be applied um, really at any time. It's not part of the paving process. It can be applied by the homeowner or the property owner, or it can be applied commercially. There are two essentially two major types of seal coat products, two types of formulations. The coal tars, uh, excuse me, the seal coats look very similar. They're both black. They both put a black coating on the, on the asphalt, um, but they're very different chemically. One is an asphalt or oil-based sealant, and that is predominantly used in the western United States. And the other kind, the formulation that is predominantly used in the Great Lakes area, as well as the eastern, southern, and central United States, has a coal tar emulsion as its base. We're looking here at a material safety data sheet, or MSDS. Um, this is product information that is required for hundreds, if not thousands, of products. And all seal coat products do have an MSDS associated with them that provides information to the consumer. And here it's telling us that refined coal tar pitch makes up about one-third of the product. And there's this CAS number associated with it. This is the number associated with coal tar pitch. So regardless of, of what we call it, whether we call it refined tar or RT12 or coal tar pitch, they all have this same CAS number, which, which helps us to identify it. And also listed on the MSDS are some of the health concerns associated with use of the product. Um, we can note that coal tar pitch is classified as a known human carcinogen, and there are associated potential health product, uh, other potential health issues associated with use of the product. Now, coal tar pitch has a very large number of different chemicals in it, but by weight, about half of it is made up of a type of chemical called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is a mouthful. We'll call those PAHs. That's usually how they're known. Um, and there are a very large number of different PAHs. But what they all have in common is the same building block, which is the benzene ring. And that's the molecule I'm showing here. It's a nice, simple, elegant molecule. It's six carbon atoms in a, in a six-sided ring shown here. And you can think of it kind of like a six-sided bathroom tile. And if you were to take bathroom tiles and arrange them in different numbers and different configurations, each one of those would be a PAH. Now, PAHs, um, there's a large number of them, but 16 of them um, are US EPA priority pollutants, and seven PAHs are classified as probable human carcinogens. PAHs are formed whenever we heat or burn any organic matter from wood to oil. Um, and because of that, there are PAHs in a very large number of urban sources, from car tires to atmosphere emissions. We're going to add to this list coal tar has large concentrations of PAHs and therefore coal tar-based pavement sealant as well. Now, given 
how many sources there are in the urban environment. They're ubiquity, and they all have some PAHs. In order to try and control concentrations of PAHs around us, we need to understand which of these sources are potentially the most important players. And we can do that by looking at the concentration of PAHs in different sources. So here we're going to look at concentrations in milligrams per kilogram, or parts per million, for a range of different PAH sources in our environment. You can see that asphalt generally has very low concentrations of PAHs down there in just a few parts per million, whereas up at the other end we have used motor oil with very high concentrations of PAHs. And uh, this probably is no surprise to most of you, given how uh, important it is to be responsible in disposing of used motor oil. Now, if we take a look at the steel coat products, we see that the asphalt-based product has relatively low concentrations of PAHs, which is not surprising given that asphalt itself has low concentrations. However, the coal tar-based product has very high PAH concentrations, more than 100 times higher than our unused motor oil. So it's easy to imagine that even a small amount of this product could potentially contribute quite a few PAH, PAHs to uh, soils or dust or other, um, other materials around us. Now, we have a product with very high PAH concentrations. So the next question we might ask is, well, how extensively is it used? The industry estimates that about 85 million gallons, gallons of coal tar-based seal coat are used, enough to cover about 170 square miles, and that's applications every year. We have found when we've looked at watersheds across the country that um, anywhere from 2 to 5 percent of the total area of a watershed might be covered in sealed pavement, and we've looked at some subdivisions where virtually every driveway has seal coat applied to it. Now, what happens once we put the seal coat on a pavement? Well, it doesn't stay there. Um, the seal coat dries and is abraded by the action of car tires and in many parts of the country, like the Great Lakes, by snow plows. And what we see is that um, after a few years, or even in many cases after a few months, the seal coat starts to wear off and you can, you can see the underlying asphalt underneath. It's for that reason that most applicators recommend reapplying seal coat every three to five years, and a lot of homeowners reapply seal coat as frequently as every year. Now, what happens to this abraded seal coat? Well, it's ground up into a fine powder or dust, and if you go out and just sweep up some of the dust off a seal coated driveway or parking lot, you'll see lots of little black bits in it, and that's pieces of the abraded seal coat. Now, in the case of coal tar-based seal coat, that dust can have very high concentrations of PAHs. So we've actually swept parking lots uh, in a number of different cities in the United States, and we see a very interesting geographic pattern. In the western United States, where the asphalt-based product is used, the concentrations are quite low, down in just a few parts per million. And in the eastern United States, in the central and southern U.S., where the coal tar product is predominantly used, we see concentrations that are in the thousands of milligrams per kilogram. And I think it's worth noting that these concentrations are similar to those at old manufactured gas plants and old coking plants, that have many of whom which have been listed as Superfund sites because of high concentrations of PAHs in this same range. Now, we've also swept parking lots in these same, not just the same cities, but the same watersheds that were not sealed, and we see much lower concentrations of PAHs. And this is interesting because these are in the same watersheds, meaning that they are getting the same type of atmospheric deposition. These parking lots, of course, also have the vehicle sources. They have vehicle emissions and used, uh, excuse me, used dripping motor oil, um, worn tire particles. And yet, we see much lower concentrations, suggesting that it's just the presence or absence of coal tar-based steel coat that is making a large difference in the concentrations in the dust. So now we have contaminated dust on the pavement. Let's take a look at all the different places that these contaminated particles can go. 
They can run off into stormwater controls or streams and lakes. They can be blown off into adjacent soil. They can stick to tires and be tracked uh, onto other non-seal coated surfaces. And they can even be tracked into our homes. And you can see why it is that a lot of these uh, this dust particles gets washed into the stormwater system. You can see here that the um, abraded particles and other dust on the pavement has kind of piled up next to the curb where it can easily go down into the stormwater system. And the MPCA has done quite a bit of work on contamination of stormwater controls and stormwater ponds. And the second presentation you'll be seeing this morning will go into that in quite a bit more detail. But here's just a quick illustration of how the seal coat can make a difference in concentrations in a stormwater pond. Here we're looking at two parking lots, one that's sealed and one that's unsealed. These are in South Carolina, and the parking lot that's sealed is sealed with the coal tar-based product. And we see that the concentrations of PAHs in these two adjacent stormwater ponds are different by more than 40 times. Yet they're receiving the same atmospheric deposition, and they're receiving uh, they're, they're close to the same types of roads. They're close to this next state, this this big state highway here. So this this is uh, somewhat contradicts the hypothesis that atmospheric deposition deposition is the most important source of PAHs to stormwater ponds. Well, we had been seeing increasing concentrations of PAHs in our USGS research in lakes across the country. And we were wondering, what is, what's the cause of these, these increasing concentrations? So here's our, here's our CSI slide. You know, scientists at heart are detectives. We gather clues, and we use them to solve mysteries, which in, in this case is, what are the most important sources of PAHs in the urban environment? And in this case, the clues are the PAH fingerprints of each source. Now, what do I mean by fingerprint for PAHs? Well, I mentioned that there are a number of different PAHs, numbers of benzene rings. And each source has a characteristic amount of these different PAHs. And that's its fingerprint. So let me illustrate this. Here is the PAH fingerprint for coal burning emissions. So we have different amounts of these different PAHs. And this, the general shape here, you can think of as the fingerprint for that source. Now, we can compare the fingerprint for sediments from Lake Ann, which is in Reston, Virginia. And we see it's a little bit similar. And we can actually quantify that similarity statistically with a Pearson's correlation coefficient of 0.6. Now, 1 would be a perfect match. Uh, 0.6 suggests that there is some similarity there. Let's take a look at another source. This is gasoline vehicle emissions, and there's its fingerprint. You can see it's quite different from the coal burning fingerprint. And it also is somewhat similar to the Lake Ann fingerprint. And this says, you know, maybe there's a little bit of PAH is coming from either of these sources in Lake Ann sediments. Now let's take a look. Here's the fingerprint for dust swept from parking lots, ultra based steel coat. And here's the fingerprint for Lake Ann. And here we have a correlation coefficient that's much closer to 1. So this is at least a first clue that maybe contributions from pavement or coal tar based seal coat could be providing PAHs to Lake Ann. But we like to go farther than this because clearly there's no single source of PAHs to any sediment. It, given the ubiquity of PAH sources in our urban environments, it's very likely that there are some PAHs coming from a number of different sources. So we went past this method, and we used a more sophisticated method developed by the US EPA. And what it does is it takes the fingerprints of multiple sources, and it determines for a given sample of sediment what the PAH contribution is for each of those sources. And we looked at many, many sources, from tire particles to used motor oil to wood burning to coal tar based seal coat. But let's take a look at some of those results. What we're looking at here are PAH concentrations for 40 urban lakes in the United States. And they're grouped geographically into the west, central, and eastern United States. And the height of the bar is the PAH concentration in the sediment sample. Now, what this statistical 
uh, mass balance approach has done is broken out the PAHs in those sediments to figure out how much each different type of source is contributing. And I've, I've grouped them here into five different categories. And what we find is that, on average, about 50% of the PAHs in the urban lakes that we sampled were coming from coal tar-based seal coat. An additional and relatively significant amount was coming from vehicle sources or coming from coal burning. One thing that's interesting maybe for some of you to point out is that the three lakes with the highest concentrations in the central United States, two of those, Palmer and Harriet, are in Minnesota, and Northridge is in Wisconsin. So there are some issues there in some of the, uh, the north central states. Another thing I'd like to draw your concentration to, your, your attention to, is this probable effect concentration. This is the PAH concentration above which we expect to see adverse effects on benthic biota. And benthic biota is just a scientific term for all the animals, the critters, all the, the ecological community that is living in those sediments, and many of which form the base of the food chain. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to the geographic difference between concentrations in the western U.S., where the asphalt product is dominantly used, and the eastern, central and eastern U.S., where the coal tar-based product is dominantly used. So let's take this comparison a little farther. We're going to look at some urban lakes that have very similar population and land use, very different concentrations of dust on their parking lots, and see how that might translate to differences in PAH concentrations in lakes. So first we're going to compare Tannis Brook Pond in Portland, Oregon, and Palmer Lake in, in, um, in uh, Minnesota. Whoops. There we go. In Minneapolis. Now these two lakes have very similar population densities, but they have very different concentrations of PAHs in their lakes, a factor of about 20. Let's take a look at two more lakes. Here's Decker Lake in Salt Lake City. And Lake Anne, which we've looked at before, that's the one with the fingerprints we looked at, in Reston, Virginia. Again, very similar population densities, but about a 20-fold difference in PAH concentrations in their lakes. Yet the land use is very similar. This is dense urban. We have multi- and single-family residential, we have big box stores, we have lots and lots of parking lots, and we have lots of roads. But we see very different concentrations of PAHs. What this is suggesting to us is that we can have background PAH concentrations in dense urban settings of only a part per million PAHs. So what are the implications? for aquatic biota if we have concentrations that exceed that PEC. There has been quite a bit of research done since we identified coal coat as an important source of PAHs to the environment um, by a number of different biologists. Some of these have focused on individual species, mostly on amphibians, frogs, and salamanders, and others have focused on whole ecological communities and demonstrated that there is a negative effect when they're exposed to sediment that's mixed with coal tar-based seal coat. But it's not just fish and frogs that are exposed to contaminated sediments and dust. People are too, in particular during play activities. We use coal tar-based seal coat near our homes. Many of you may have applied seal coat to your driveways or your parking lot, at your workplace, your children's school, your grocery store, even your church might also have seal coat. So we were interested in finding out if the use of seal coat on pavement near residences could affect concentrations of seal coat in, uh, in house dust. We looked at 23 ground floor apartments in Austin, Texas, about half of them were near parking lots that had either unsealed asphalt or asphalt-based seal coat. Those are those on the left. And the other half had coal tar-based seal coat. We vacuumed up parts from the parking lots themselves, and we saw concentrations very similar to the picture that we saw nationally. We had just a few parts per million in the dust from the parking lots that did not have the coal tar-based seal coat. And we saw thousands of parts per million in the concentrations on the parking lots with the coal tar, coal tar seal coat. 
And that translated into a large difference as well in PAHs in house dust, about a 25-fold difference in concentrations. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because people, and in particular small children, ingest house dust. Little kids put their hands and objects in their mouths. They spend a lot of time on the floor. Now, before the research that we had done on house dust, it was assumed that dietary ingestion, that is, from the food we eat, is the greatest source of PAHs to children. But that wasn't taking into account ingestion of high concentrations of PAHs in house dust. So working with Dr. Spencer William Ayler, who's a human health risk analyst, we looked at the PAH doses to preschoolers in residences with house dust PAH concentrations similar to what we measured in Austin. And we found that, in fact, in these scenarios, even for those children that ingest a relatively low amount of house dust, it greatly exceeds the PAHs they're getting from dietary ingestion. And some children who ingest more dust are getting an even higher dose of PAHs from house dust. So how important is that? Well, we took that a step farther, and with Dr. Williams, we looked at human health risk, the excess lifetime cancer risk associated with ingestion of both house dust and soil affected by coal tar-based seal coat. And we found that there was a much higher excess cancer, lifetime cancer risk for residents who spent their entire lifetime oh. living near seal coated yeah. pavement. In fact, it exceeded one in 10,000, which is the risk at which remediation, that is removing the source, generally is advised. So another way that humans can be exposed to PAH is associated seal coat is through the air. Of course, there, there's clearly during application, that's a potential issue. But we've done two studies that have measured PAHs released into the air from seal coat. And we found that even years after application, the amount released from the pavement to the air is about 60 times greater than that released from unsealed pavement. We also found that the greatest releases occur in about the first two weeks following application. And from our studies, we estimated that that amount is about 2.5 grams per square meter of pavement. So let's do a simple calculation here. Ladies and gentlemen, start your calculators. We have use figures of about 85 million gallons per year, which is enough to cover about 440 square kilometers. And we've estimated that that releases about 2.5 grams per square meter during the drying process, the first two weeks after application. That translates to about 1,000 megagrams or 1,000 metric tons, which is a little bit more than 2,000 pounds of PAH emissions every year just associated with that drying period. Now, how does that measure up compared to other sources? Well, it actually exceeds U.S. vehicle emissions as reported for 2010. So it looks like coal tar based seal coats are potentially an important source of PAHs to the atmosphere. So that's a summary of the research to date. Um, we're continuing to do research on this subject at the USGS and, and hope to have more publications coming out, but you can access uh, both USGS and scientific uh, journal publications on this subject at this website. You're also welcome to contact me or my co-author at the USGS, Pete Van Meter, or any of the co-authors of our studies who have also done some studies independently. Um, so I would encourage you to, to contact any of them as well. Um, and if you download this presentation, you'll find references uh, for all of the publications that I've cited during the presentation. So with that, I would like to thank you, Al, and pass it on to the next speaker.